Okay, so good day to everyone. So for today, we're going to discuss uh, chapter 4 of our subject, which is going to cover financial forecasting. So this is where we are going to have already multiple uh, computations. So this is the computation part already. And from here on forward, uh, onwards to our class, we're going to have more uh, computations. So last meeting, we already discussed financial analysis, which is actually more of computation already. And this time, we're going to have another set of uh, tools that we are going to use as financial managers later on. And this is financial forecasting. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, let's move on to the chapter outline. So these are the items that we are going to discuss there. So for the chapter out outline, these are the items that we are going to be discussing. First is uh, financial forecasting in a firm strategic growth. So how are we going to use forecasting in order for us to determine what's going to happen in, uh, to the company in the next succeeding or in the succeeding periods. Next is we're also going to prepare forecasts for our three financial statements, namely our um, income statement, our balance sheet, and our cash flow statement. Next, we are going to uh, determine the percentage of sales method or use the percent percentage of sales method in uh, forecasting uh, the sales of the company. Fourth, we're going to determine or um, study the methods that we are using to determine the amount of new funds required in advance. So this is uh, in, in anticipation to the growth of the company. And finally, we are going to discuss factors that affect cash flow. Okay, so let us first discuss our financial forecasting. So financial forecasting is important because it is necessary for the business to know and to plan ahead of the company's operations in order for them to anticipate um, certain results and certain costs as well as uh, for them to anticipate the performance of the company in the future. Um, in the second bullet point, it says there that outcome of a firm through external events might be a function of both risk-taking desires and the ability to hedge against risk with planning. That is why in order for us to be able to manage our risks and plan ahead, we must first determine what's going to probably happen to our operations. And with uh, financial forecasting, we will be able to do that. Next, um, if there is uh, no growth or a decline, okay, not it is not the primary uh, cause of a shortage of funds. Okay, so uh, what we are trying to say in bullet point number three is that if in case there is no growth or no decline, at least we can plan ahead in order for us not to have a shortage of funds later on and still plan our finances and our uh, disbursements and receipts. And then, a comprehensive financing plan must be developed for a significant growth. So again, in case uh, there is a significant growth ahead based on your forecast, then you need to prepare and you need to uh, look for um, ways and alternatives for you to be able to source out funds and prepare for the operations later on. So how are we going to construct our pro forma statements? Okay, so this is uh, what we are going to do. By the way, when you talk about pro forma statements, it pertains to your projected, okay? Projected statements or these are pertaining to uh, what you are anticipating based on historical data and based on projections as to what will happen to your financial performance and your financial condition. So uh, this approach okay, is consisting of three items. So first, constructing, okay, constructing your for a while, constructing your income statement based on uh, or your financial statements based on sales projections and then based on production plans. Next, we are going to translate okay, translate it into a cash budget. So the projection of your sales will now be translated into cash budget, which will affect later on your statement of cash flows. 
And then finally, you are going to project or assimilate all of the results of the first two items into your pro forma or projected balance sheet. So that was going to happen there. Okay, so income. And then after income, cash flows. After cash flows, then we have the balance sheet. So this is the process of how we are going to prepare our pro forma balance sheet. So just like what we said, we start first with the sales projection, which will affect later our production plan. And then the production plan will be in the form of your projected income statement. From the projected income statement, you are going to prepare the cash budget or the cash flows. Okay? And in order for you to prepare the cash budget, you also need other supporting documents and budgets, which will generally involve your capital budgets. And then all of this combined, also considering your prior balance sheet, in order for us to create trends or to uh, determine the trends and the possible uh, percentages of changes, then we can now provide our pro forma balance sheet. So this is the process. So let us now go to our pro forma income statement. So the pro forma in, uh, income statement or the projected income statement will provide us a projection of the anticipated profits okay, over a uh, subsequent period or subsequent periods if you are going to prepare multiple projections. So what are the four important steps that we are going to follow? First, we are going to establish a sales projection. Second, we are going to determine production schedules okay, and the associated material usage as well as direct labor and overhead in order for us to arrive at the gross profit. So we are basically getting the cost of sales here after getting the sales and then anticipate the other expenses and then finally get the profit there. So let us use this example for us to be able to make a sales, sales projection. So assuming we will use um, the information of Goldman Corporation, which produces two main products, wheels and casters. So this is the quantity, the sales price, and the sales revenue, giving us a total of 100,000. So this is going to be your projection. The question is, how did you project this? Of course, you used various project, uh, projection tools. But generally, uh, these items you are going to project by uh, using information in the previous periods. So let's just assume that this is already your projection. Okay, so how did we get the sales revenue? We simply multiplied the quantity by the sales price. So for the wheels, you're expecting sales of 30,000. 30, and then for caster, 70,000. So that's a total of 100,000. So with that, after you, are, after you are able to determine the sales or the projected sales, next thing that you need to do is to determine how much you need to produce Okay, in order for you to cover all of the projected sales or the expected sales. So in this example, based on your um, actual information, the inventory of your wheels and casters are only 185 and 180. So let us go back to the previous slide to check. It says here that you are going to, you are expecting 1,000 wheels and 2,000 casters as your sales units during the uh, succeeding period. However, based on your stock of inventory, you only have 85 for wheels and 180 for casters, which means that you need to produce more in order for you to cover the sales. So what are you going to do there? You are simply going to have this computation. Okay? So you are going to First, um, determine okay, the units, okay, the total units that you need based on the projected sales, and then add the desired ending inventory, and then deduct the beginning inventory for you to get the production requirements. So that's basically what you're going to do. You get the units of projected sales, add the desired ending inventory, deduct the beginning inventory, and you will now get the production requirements. So let us assume this one. So in this case, for the wheels and the casters, this is your projection. 
So, if you have your book or if you have a book of um, for financial management, you can actually see it in the tables provided here. But anyway, we can actually use this illustration. So, since for the wheels, you're expecting 1,000 units of sales and 2,000 units of sales for the casters, and you are um, desiring 10%, um, okay? So, we will assume... 10% uh, of unit sales from the time period. So we are going to uh, get 100 here and 200 here. This is based on the assumption. Of course, if you encounter problems later on, you look into the actual projections or the actual desired ending inventory. So that's 1,000 plus 100. And we will deduct 85. This was the previous beginning inventory or in stock in the previous slide. And then you will now get total units to be produced at 1,015 for the wheels. And then for the casters, that will be 2,000 plus 200 minus 180. You will get 2,020. So this is now the units that you need to produce. Okay. So from the projected sales, you now have the projected production of your inventory items. So the question now is, how are you going to compute for the unit costs? So, of course, you, al you already learned in your previous subjects the components of the unit costs of a product, which are generally your materials, labor, and your overhead. So, according to the information given to us, to produce one unit of wheels or one unit of wheel, you need to uh, incur $10 of materials, $5 of labor, and $3 of overhead. So, with that, your total unit cost is $18, and for the casters, $12 and $6, as well as $4 for materials, labor, and overhead respectively, for a total of $22. So this is now your, or these are now your unit costs for wheels and casters. So with that, we can now compute. So if we need to produce 1,015 units of wheels and 2,020 units of casters, we multiply them or these items by their respective unit costs and you will now project the total cost associated with the production which is now $18,270 for the wheels and $44,440 uh, for the casters. Having a total unit cost or total cost for the production of both products at $62,710. There. So now... We can now compute for our cost of goods sold. So always remember now in the pre in the preparation of your cost of goods sold, these are the basic assumptions that we are going to use. Okay. So we will assume that the FIFO accounting is used, meaning we are going to use first the beginning inventory or the existing inventory before we use the um, the items that we produced. Okay, which means that when we have FIFO, we allocate or, fi or first allocate the cost of the uh, current sales to the beginning inventory. Okay, and then uh, we will we are going to use the goods manufactured during the period when we use up already all of the beginning inventory items. So with that, this is our projected uh, gross profit. Gross profit. So we go to the wheels first. So we already stated a while ago that we are going to, we are expecting to sell 1,000 units of the wheels. We are going to uh, sell it at $30, so we are expecting sales revenue of uh, 30,000. Now, we are going to uh, compute or we are going to determine our cost of goods sold. So again, we are going to use first the beginning inventory that we have, which is 85 units and multiplied by $16. This is the cost of our original beginning inventory. So this is now the cost of goods sold associated. Now, since we are selling 1,000 units and only 85 units are from the beginning inventory, it means that you still have 915 units that you are going to take or you are going to get from the current production. And now the cost there is $18 based on our cost of uh, production or the total unit cost based on the previous slide. So the cost there is $16,470. So 30000 
minus the costs of the items that we sold, 1,360 from the beginning inventory, and 16,470 from the current production. The total cost of goods sold now is 17,830, giving us a gross profit of 12,170, which is taken from 30,000 minus the cost of goods sold. So that is for your wheels. We do the same for our casters. So we simply follow the process that we did to the wheels and we will get gross profit of 26,360 which gives us now a combined gross profit of 38,530. So this is now your projected gross profit. Now, how are we going to get the value of our ending inventory? Well, generally what we are simply going to do is to get the total units or the total number of units that will be left from the wheels and from the casters and multiply it by the uh, production cost. And based on the information here, your ending inventory is 6,200. So which is basically, if you look into the information, this is the total cost of your beginning inventory. This is the total production cost minus the cost of goods sold. This is now going to be the ending inventory. There is an alternative approach to this. What you're going to do is to simply get the ending inventory in units. Based on our previews, um, based on our uh, projected production a while ago, it's stated there that your desired ending inventory is 100 units of wheels and 200 units of casters. So let's try to go back there and... Um, look for that particular information. So it's, I think it's this one here. You see? So you are expecting 100 units of wheels and 200 units of casters. From there, let us try to determine the unit costs of this one or unit production cost of each item. I think it's here. So there. So 18 and 22. So let's try to compute. If you have 100 units of ending inventory for wheels, and that's $18 per unit, then that's equivalent to 1,800. Okay? Now, if you have 200 units of casters multiplied by the $22 per unit, then that's 4,400. So let's add those two. That's 1,800 plus... 4,400, that's already 6,200. So let's go back to our ending inventory. That's actually the same amount, 6,200. Okay. Next, we are now going to project our other expenses. So other expenses now will, be, will involve the computation of our uh, selling and general administrative expenses, interest expenses, and others. And we're also going to compute for the after-tax income or the net income after tax. And then we are going to uh, determine also our retained earnings. So you, you need to uh, recall your knowledge in basic accounting in order for you to be able to complete this. Okay. So... Looking into the information, so let us simply assume that you have now given or you are now given with other informations. So we with the sales revenue of 100,000, cost of goods sold of 61,470, you will have a gross profit of 38,530. Assume that they gave you already or the problem gave you general and administrative expense of 12,000, you will get an operating profit or a bit of 26,530. We will deduct the 1,500, assuming also that the problem gave you this amount already for your interest expense. You now have your earnings before taxes. And then we will compute the taxes, assuming it is at 20%, so you get 20% of 25,030, which is equal to $5,006. You will now get earnings after taxes of 20,000, um, and $24. And assuming we will pay dividends of 1500 uh, you will now get the increase in your retained earnings, which is the amount that we uh, retain in the income 
at 18,524. So it's either you follow this format or you simply go back to how you learned um, the preparation of your income statement in your basic accounting. With that, we can now go to our cash budget. So the cash budget is now needed in order for us to determine how much cash or how much how much funds are we uh, do we need to have in order for us to cover all of these items that are going to be used up for the current operations. So we are also going to consider both long term and short term items as well as the time frames in order for us to determine the timing of our inflows and our cash flows. So let us assume that this is our monthly pattern. Okay? So this let's assume that this is the monthly sales pattern for the first 6 months. Okay? So assuming 15,000, 10,000, 15,000, 25,000, 15,000 and another 20,000 as our projected sales for the first 6 months. Next thing that we're going to do is to determine our cash receipts. Okay? So, let us use this information for us to determine our cash receipts. Of course, for every problem or for every company, there will be a different computation or projection depending on how much or what they are expecting. So, let us go back again to the Goldman Corporation's example. So, sales have already been provided to us. And let us assume that a careful analysis of past sales and collection records show that 20% of sales is collected during the month of sale while the 80% is collected in the following month. So how are we going to determine our cash receipts? So let us compute this one. Okay? So it says there, of course, in this example, you already you also have the December information because it is needed in the computation of your collections from the previous month okay so it says there the collections okay is as follows 20% is based on the current month sales and the remaining 80% is based on the previous okay previous month sales because it will be collected in the next month so how did we get these amounts Basically, you just get 20% of the current month sales. So, this amount here in the middle is actually 20% of the current month projected sales. And how did we get these items? These are basically 80% of the previous month's sales. So, 9,600 is 80% of the December sales. 12,000 is 80% of the January sales which will be collected in February, so on and so forth. So basically, you just follow what is the uh, given item for your projection. With that, you are now expecting to get total cash receipts from January to June with these amounts. Okay? So these are the expected amounts of collections or cash receipts during the month of January to June. This is not difficult, just follow what is the pattern of collection based on what the problem gave you. With that, we need now to compute also for the estimated cash payments, which is related to our expenses, our production, and the payments of our interest, taxes, dividends, and other items, including payments in case we need new uh, 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 property, plant, and equipment. So let us determine this one now. So we already know the, project, pro the, the production cost or the projected cost for the wheels and the casters. And based on the information, this was actually computed already a while ago. Getting the total, we are expecting a total production cost of 62,710. And this is based on the production of 1,000 and 15 units of wheels and 2,020 units of casters. So this is the expected cost to be incurred in the production of the inventory items. Also, using the assumptions as follows, costs are incurred on an equal monthly basis over a six-month period. Sales volume varies each month. 
employment of level uh, monthly production to ensure maximum efficiency. Payment of material once a month after purchases have been made. So this is now going to be the assumption that we are going to use in determining our cash payments. So these items are our assumptions. Let's see what's going to happen. So with that, this is already our projected item. These are the total costs of your material labor and overhead based on the uh, given information for our total manufacturing cost. If the time frame is 6 months and it's stated in the assumptions in the previous slide that the costs are incurred evenly. Okay, let's just go back to reiterate. There, costs are incurred at an equal monthly basis over the 6-month period. So, it means that we simply divide this by 6 months and you will get the average monthly cost. Which means that this is already the monthly cost that we are going to use for the payments later on. Next. We are also going to consider all other information. So it says there, the payment of materials okay, is going to be uh, done during the next period. Okay? Which means that all of the purchases here will be paid next month. So the December purchases was paid on January. Okay? The January purchases will be paid on February. Okay? So that is how you're going to analyze those items. Okay? Now, monthly labor cost is also going to simply place there because it says in the problem that you're going to, uh, you're just going to incur it during the same period as well as the monthly overhead. Okay? To clarify, let's just go back to the previous slide and show that assumption. It says there. Okay? So, costs are incurred okay, on an equal monthly basis over six months. Okay. The only item that is not uh, paid during the same period is the materials, which is paid uh, one month or a month after the purchase have been made. So it's going to be delayed by one month. Okay. So going back. So this the purchase of materials is delayed, but the payment for labor and overhead will be on the same period. We also are going to pay the general and administrative expense equally over the 6 months. The 12000 was given already a while ago, so we're just going to plot it there. Interest expense will just be placed there because um, um, as provided in our information, let's just go back again. Um, where did we get that? It's not given here, so we, we are going to assume that it is going to just be placed here. In at the end of the six months, okay, and then taxes will be at the end of the six months also. But since there is two payments, this is an assumption, so we're going to pay every quarter. So we divide the taxes into two. That's going to be one for the first quarter, which is going to end on March, and one on the second quarter, which will end in June. And then cash dividend of one thousand five hundred is going to be paid at the end of the six month period. So. Let us assume these are not these are not uh, computed yet, but assume these are given information. This is going to be the purchase of new equipment, okay? February and June. So these are given items. This is not part of the projections. So this is now your expected total payment. So with the computations from January to June, you are now able to determine what amounts, okay? The certain amounts that you need to prepare in order for you to pay up all of the cash payments that are anticipated from January to June. Based on the information, the most uh, payments that we need is already in June. So we need to project more cash or to prepare more cash during this period. Okay. So with that, we are now going to prepare an actual budget. Okay. So, the actual budget now is going to be the net amount based on the total receipts and total payments. So, the total receipts were already given to you a while ago. This is based on the collection. And the total payments is based on the previous slide, the total payments anticipated from January to June. And you are now going to get the net cash flow. Okay? So, there is no problem if your net cash flow is positive. Okay? Because at least you, you have a positive cash flow. 
what you are going to need to consider is the years or the months, I mean, the months that has a negative cash flow because during these months, you may need to have additional financing to cover the negative cash flows, okay, and so that you will not have a, a negative cash balance later on. There. So, with that, let us continue. So, assuming this is already the negative cash flow or the cash flows that we that we are expecting, and let us assume that this is the balances. Okay, so how did we compute these balances, by the way? So, generally, what you're simply going to do there is to um, add these two, and that's already your beginning balance here. Add these two, okay, and then you're, it's, it's just going to move forward here. Okay, so assuming, okay, assuming that these are the beginning cash balances, this is now already your cumulative cash balance. Okay? So from there, how are how what's going to happen? So if you want to determine how we got this, it's like this. So that's going to be 1380 plus 5000, that's already 6380. Okay? 6380 um we're going to deduct it with the uh, 6,452 here, and you will get negative 72. Okay? We are going to have an assumption here below. We assume the Golden Corporation or Goldman Corporation has a beginning balance of 5,000, and it desires a minimum monthly ending balance of 5,000. Okay? So whenever, whenever it reaches a negative balance, we are going to restore it back to 5,000. So that's the concept there. So in in for January we have no problem, okay? We have no problem for January because the balance is six thousand three hundred eighty. So no problem there. We do not need to borrow money, okay? However, on February, just like what we said, if this is the balance that we are going to forward here, okay? From this from January, we forward it to February. So we are going to get negative seventy two, which means that we need to borrow money, okay? So, we are going to borrow money in order for us to um, get or we are in order for us to be able to restore the ending balance to the desired 5,000. Okay? So, we are going to borrow 5,000, 72 there. So, it's now going to be 5,000. We carry it forward here. Okay? Next month, during March, we also have a negative cash flow again. So, our balance is only... 1,045. Since we want a 5,000 balance, we're going to borrow another 3,955. Okay? Giving us now a total of 9,027 loan. So, next month, we are going to carry forward again the 5,000. This time, we have a positive cash flow. So, our balance is 9,548. Okay? 9,548, we are going to use the excess cash to pay up our liability. Okay? So, since we only need 5,000, we have an excess of 4,548. We use that to pay up the liability here and the balance remaining here will now be 4,479. Carry it forward here. Another positive cash flow. So, our, our total cash is now 15,548 and we need to pay up this loan. Okay? So, we, now we do not have any loan because we have already paid up everything and still our balance is 11,069. We carry it forward there. Okay? And with uh, the June item having a total negative cash flow of 11,953, there is now a um, negative cash balance of $884, which means that we need to borrow 5,884 because we desire a 5,000 balance based on the given information. So, at the end of June, we still have to borrow another amount of 5,884 okay, in order for us to have the desired cash balance of 5,000. So, this is the most critical of all if we're going to budget our cash already. There. So, with that, we can now prepare our pro forma balance sheet. So, we will combine all information that are sorry, provided and we're going to prepare now our pro forma or projected balance sheet. 
So again, your, you need your prior balance sheet. Get the information from your pro forma income statement, production, inventory, cash budget, and everything. Combine all of those and you will get the pro forma balance sheet. And this is now your pro forma balance sheet. Assuming that we are going to assuming that we are going to get the informations provided in our examples. So those items that are in a different color are actually uh, items that were not discussed or that were not based on our computations. The cash of 5,000 is actually the desired cash balance. Marketable security is not given. Accounts receivable of 9,600 is based on the um, uncollected portion of your sales. Inventory is the desired level of inventory, but it is already December 2008. Okay. And then these are also the other informations there. So with that, if this is the previous, okay, if this is the previous year information and we are going to get the six month balance, this is now going to be the end result. Question now is where did we get these items? For the cash, it is the same because we always desire a $5,000 cash balance. So it will always be $5,000 there. Marketable securities of $3,200 is taken from the previous year because there will be no projections there. Accounts receivable of $16,000, where did we get this? This is based on the uncollected portion. So let us go back to our sales. Let's just go back to our sales projection so that we will get that information it's going to be for a while let's just look for it because it's based on the pattern of our cash receipts okay there so basically if you look into all of this information how are we going to get the balance of the receivable you, sim you simply get all of the sales and then you deduct all of the re receipts here. Okay, the remaining balance. So again, get all of the sales and then get all of the uh, collections. Okay, deduct the collection from the total sales and you will get the ending balance of the receivable. Okay, or if you want to compute it in the most efficient way, since the collection pattern is 20% on the month of sale and 80% of the next month, all of the sales from December to May are already collected. The only amount that is not yet collected is actually 80% of the June sales. Because 80% of the June sales will still be collected in July. So what is 80% of 20,000? That's 16,000. So if you go back to our projected balance sheet, that's actually 16,000 there. Okay? Inventory of 6,200 is the same ending inventory that we already computed a while ago. Which gives us a total current asset of 30,400. We now have the uh, plant and equipment. This is a given item. We do not know uh, how this was computed because um, there are no details. But anyway, this is the total assets all in all. Accounts payable, notes payable, long-term debt. Um... Common stock and retained earnings, you will get the same amount. Now, the question here is, where did we get the accounts payable? Okay. So, the accounts payable information here is taken from the projected payments here. So let's just go to the projected payments. So, those that are pending payments will be our accounts payable. But I think there is no information here. Okay. The only information that is given is actually the material because it's, it's, uh, it's stated in the assumption a while ago that we are we only pay the materials a month after the sale or a month after the purchase. So if we purchase materials of 5,732 and it's going to be paid next month, then this will be our accounts payable. So if you go to our financial statement, that's also the accounts payable there. Where did we get the notes payable? The notes payable is the amount of loan that we borrowed based on our cash or our cash budget. Okay, so that's the amount that we borrowed in order for us to 
get the 5,000 cash that is uh, desired at the end of the period. Okay? And then, long-term debt, we do not have this information. So, I think that's just a given item. Common stock is given. Retained earnings is going to be computed as, let's go back to the previous slide. That's 20,500 plus the increase in retained earnings that we got here in our pro forma income statement. That's 18,524. That's the increase in our retained earnings. So this one is going to be, or this amount, 18,524, will be added to the prior year from this or to this amount and you will get 39,024. Okay, so that's the increase or that's the beginning balance. Again, that's 20,500 plus the 18,000 a while ago. Increase in retained earnings. So you will now get the retained earnings there and you now have the balance sheet. Okay, so this is very complicated but you simply need to follow. Okay, as financial managers later on, you need to follow all of this. Okay, you simply follow the projections, follow the assumptions of the company and use it in order for you to project the amounts that are going to be presented in your financial statements and most importantly in your balance sheet because the final amount will be taken here. So, what now is the analysis of our pro forma? So, with this information, we can now analyze the previous items or the previous figures with the current figures. So, this is one analysis that was given there. Uh, the growth was financed by accounts payable, notes payable, and profit as reflected by the increase in retained earnings. So if you look at the information, I think the months here are wrong. Okay, Let's just look at the increase of 25,640. Let us go back to our previous item. Okay, So if this is 50,050, okay, the total assets was 50,050 at the end of 2008. And it became 76,140. So if we're going to compute, that's going to be 76,140 minus the previous year amount of 50,500. There is a 25,640 increase, which was actually reflected here. 25,640. And how did we get this? It was financed by your accounts payable, your notes payable, and your profit. So, how did we know that it was financed by accounts payable, notes payable, and profit? Because generally, the increases in your assets, let's just go back, the increases in your assets were actually taken from this also. The changes in asset is equal to the changes in your liabilities and equity. Isn't it? Okay. So, that's basically the concept there. Okay. Now we go to the percent of sales method. So let us, it is based on the assumption that accounts on the balance sheet will maintain a given percentage relationship to sales. Okay? Notes payable, common stock, and retained earnings do not maintain a direct relationship with sales volume. In other words, it simply means that the increase in your sales will also result in a proportional increase in your receivables. The decrease in your sales will also result in a decrease in the balance of your receivables. That's basically the concept here. Okay? So, with uh, this consideration, let us simply try to analyze what happened here. Okay? So, your asset, assuming... This is now a, a different corporation. This is a different corporation already. So, based on the percentage of sales... Okay? So, if the sales is... The sales is assuming 200,000, so it's given. Okay. And we are simply going to get the percentage of sales. We will divide these amounts by the sales. Okay. So how did we get 2.5%? Okay. So that's basically 5,000 here, the 5,000 here, and divide it by 200,000 here. And you will get 2.5%. Okay, how did we get 20%? We get 40,000 here and divide it by 200,000 of the sales. 
and you will get 20%. Okay? So, that's basically how you do the percentage. Okay? So, the concept of, per the concept of percentage of sales is you get the items here, the items in your balance sheet, and use it as the numerator, and then divide it by the sales, okay? And you will get now the percentage here. So, generally, that's how the percentage of sales is computed. Okay? So, one more example just for us to get it. If the inventory is 25,000, we divide it by 200,000, and you will get 12.5%. Okay, so you do the same. That's actually the percentage of sales. Now, we are also going to use the percentage of sales method to determine whether we need to borrow or plan also our financing later on. Okay, so this is now another set of complicated computation. So this is going to be um, the formula. Okay, so in this case, it's either you memorize this or you simply internalize the effect. Okay, so RNF is re required new funds. Okay, and it is going to be equal to uh, the formula A times the change in the sales minus L times the change in the sales minus PS2 um, multiplied by 1 minus D and this is going to be divided by S where A divided by S is the percentage relationship of variable assets to sales. Okay, The delta S is the change in sales. L divided by S is the percentage relationship of variable liabilities to sales and the profit margin for P. S2 is the new sales level and D is the dividend payout. So let us get um, where did we get 60% here. Okay, so we will go back to our previous slide. So that's 60% there and this is 25% here. So this is the percentage change in our assets. This is the percentage change in our liabilities. Okay, so looking into the formula, going back. Um, where did we get uh, the $100 change in sales? Okay, so we assume that in the given information, the previous sales was only $100,000 and now it is $200,000. So that's because the information is not given here. But that is how you get the change in sales. Okay, so you get the current sales minus the previous sales. Okay, so with that, 60% times $100,000 minus 25% times 100,000, minus 6%, 6% is the profit margin. Okay, you know already how to compute that. Multiplied by the new sales level, okay, which is now 300,000 because of the increase of 200,000, times 1 minus, what's 50%? That is the dividend payout ratio. So assuming again that this is already given. So following the formula, you now have 26,000 here, which means that you need an additional 26,000 sources of new funds. Okay? So you need to raise 26,000 uh, in relation to um, the increase in sales in order for you to cover all of your financing needs. Okay? So with that, what if we are assuming that the company is not operating at full capacity? Okay, then um, you need to add more current assets to increase sales. Okay, so with this, assuming that we are we are only considering this percentage of increase. Okay, 35 for the assets, 25 for the sales, okay, Ay, sorry, liability, 6%, same, okay, so this is for your current assets only, okay, how did you get this, okay, so we are going to go back again to our computation here, that's 35% for your uh, total current assets, and this is 25% for your total current liabilities, because we do not have long-term liabilities there, so going back to the computation, Okay, if 35% is needed for the increase in current assets based on the computation there, 
that we provided, 25% for the current liability. Same information here, 6% is the profit margin, 50% um, is the payout ratio. You, need, you know, It now means that you need to uh, have an additional 1,000 of funds okay, in order for you to cover the growth of the sales. So you need to add 1,000 additional sources of funds. Okay, There. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, we are going to have an assessment later on. And you need to practice. So to practice the computation. So I'm also going to give you a practice set on the computation of these items. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you.